Professor Joshua Shulman has just come from Houston at the Baylor College of Medicine. But with he began um, at Harvard, went to Cambridge to get a PhD in genetics. This is Cambridge, UK, not across the river. And then uh, came back to the Massachusetts General Hospital to do uh, his neurology residency, trained in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease, and then learned to work with a very interesting model organism, the fruit fly, and has been collaborating in many ways to kind of take these loci that Dr. Ramirez and we find and then really understand what's happening at the level of the cells and the brain so that we can then have a better understanding how to attack these pathways. So it's my honor and pleasure to welcome Professor Shul. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sashadri and the Biggs Institute for uh, inviting me here. I mean, Dr. Ramirez definitely beat me out in terms of miles traveled uh, to get here. I just came from Houston. Um, but uh, I think, actually, we're, we're from different places globally, uh, but we're all working on the same problems. You'll see a lot of uh, the similar themes that, that he introduced uh, here in this talk. Um, so I'm going to tell you, as Dr. Sashadri said, how we use uh, the lowly fruit fly to understand Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So um, these are the things that I want to communicate to you today, my objectives. Um, I'm going to introduce Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease genetics uh, and genomics, and this is going to overlap with what Dr. Ramirez just told you, so it'll be a, a bit of a review. Um, then I'm going to talk about the specific challenges and roadblocks that I think stand in the way of going from human genetics to new drugs and understanding new biology of Alzheimer's disease. And lastly, I'm going to show you how simple experimental models like the fruit fly can actually help us overcome these challenges in ways that sometimes we can't do with other systems. So it seems ambitious, but trust me with this journey. Um, so just to introduce Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, uh, these may seem uh, in your minds like two very different conditions. Uh, in Parkinson's disease, predominantly people have trouble with their movement. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, of course, people predominantly have trouble uh, early on in the disease with their thinking and their memory. Uh, but there are some very important similarities. Uh, they're both highly uh, age dependent, so we see the prevalence of the disease increasing significantly with aging. Um, and uh, importantly, when we look at the brains of people who die with either Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, uh, we find that uh, in both cases there are proteins in the brain that seem to be behaving abnormally. Uh, the proteins aggregate and form large clumps. Uh, in Parkinson's disease, we find these clumps that are called Lewy bodies. They're clumps of a protein called alpha-synuclein, and they form in neurons, and then those neurons die. And they happen to be that the neurons that are most vulnerable are in regions of the brain that are important in movement. In Alzheimer's disease, uh, similar protein clumps form uh, in neurons, uh, protein aggregates uh, of the amyloid beta peptide or a protein called tau form structures in brains that are recognized called plaques or tangles that you may have uh, heard about. Um, and these form in regions of the brain that subsequently uh, have significant atrophy, and that's what's shown here. Uh, so this is a brain from somebody who died with Alzheimer's disease, and you're not supposed to see all of this space. These are regions of the brain that are shrinking due to cell neurodegenerative death. And in Parkinson's disease, um, this is uh, in the brain stem. These are two cuts through the brain stem. This is a normal brain stem. And this stripe, this black stripe, is called the substantia nigra. And it is very uh, light and almost gone in somebody who died with Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is a region of the brain that's essential for normal movement. Um, and so this shows you the exquisite loss of cells uh, within the brain stem of somebody with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take a major step back here uh, just to introduce genetics. We've already heard uh, a lot about genetics, but I'm going to assume uh, no knowledge. Um, so uh, within each of our cells, including the cells of the brain, uh, there is a nerve center uh, of the cell where all of the 
uh, recipe for cellular behavior uh, is, is, is stored, uh, and that, that recipe is encoded within the genome. Uh, the genome is organized into chromosomes, which you've probably heard of, and if you unravel chromosomes, you get this strand of DNA. This is the genetic code, uh, letters uh, like you can see here. Um, and so there is a massive amount of genetic material in every cell of the body, including every cell of the brain. And this is the basis for uh, genetic variation uh, within the population. So uh, keeping it again very simple, uh, if you imagine that uh, this is the uh, uh, genetic code of individual A, and we compare it to individual B, which might, for example, be somebody who develops Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, we can identify changes. So in this case, uh, a single letter of the code has been changed from T to C. We would call this a variation or a point mutation uh, that changes one letter to another. Uh, and these type of tiny changes in a genome that in includes Sorry, a genome that includes three billion letters, uh, a single change like this can cause Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease in rare cases. Um, so uh, these, these single letters uh, ha are, are really important that you get the code quite, quite right. So um, years ago now, uh, we began to find, we meaning the field of neurogenetics, uh, began to discover families in which single point mutations, like the one that I just showed you in cartoon format, actually cause uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and similar neurodegenerative uh, disorders. So um, here I'm showing you an example uh, from 1998 uh, where a family was described, and this is the family depicted in a pedigree, uh, and maybe you're familiar with pedigrees like this. Uh, they're showing just diamonds to uh, kind of anonymize the family so you don't know who's a boy and who's a girl. Um, the filled in diamonds represent individuals who developed early onset dementia, okay? And you can see that this family has almost a genetic curse because in every degeneration, uh, many individuals are developing early dementia. And this is showing you the experiment that allows the geneticist to see uh, this extra uh, appearance of a band in individuals who have dementia, uh, but not in those who are unaffected. And uh, this, when lots and lots of work was done, it was turned out that this uh, curse of early onset familial dementia is caused by a mutation in a gene called MAPT, or tau, okay? And it turns out that this gene uh, encodes for a protein in the brain that uh, aggregates to form this pathology called neurofibrillary tangles, okay, which I introduced earlier. It's one of the defining pathologies of Alzheimer's disease. So this was an extraordinarily important discovery in 1998 because it, before that time, uh, we knew that in brains of individuals who die with Alzheimer's disease, you will find these tangle things. But we never could know for certain whether it was just a consequence of cells dying or whether it actually had some important cause in the disease itself. Um, but here, uh, this discovery showed us that a mutation within that gene invariably causes uh, early onset dementia, which suggests strongly that this pathological feature, the tangle, is causative for not just this rare form of familial dementia, but perhaps Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of other work has borne that out. Okay, why flies? This is supposed to be about flies. Um, well, I'm gonna tell you why flies, because we, we, we wanna do is we wanna understand how mutations in genes like tau cause dementia, uh, and how other types of gene variations uh, cause Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So I need to tell you why flies. A um, couple of points that may be surprising. Uh, first of all, the fly genome, the genetic material in the fly, looks a lot like the genetic material uh, in, in human beings and other mammals. Uh, about two-thirds of all human disease genes are actually present in fruit flies. So that allows us to study the majority of genes that are implicated in human disease. Um, flies allow for very quick and very easy genetic manipulation. 
We can take a male and a female fly, put them in a vial, and 10 days later, we have hundreds of flies, okay? <laughs> that is quick uh, genetics. It allows us to manipulate the genomes very quickly. Uh, also, uh, virtually any gene of interest among the, the 10,000 plus genes that are within the genome, uh, we can pick uh, available fly strains that exist within the scientific community to manipulate them very quickly. So uh, it doesn't require us to kind of build new flies from scratch, if you will. The same is not quite true, for example, if you were going to do experiments using mouse models uh, of Alzheimer's disease. So this is really quite powerful. Um, and, and lastly, the fly uh, has conserved neurochemistry and conserved complex behaviors. Um, of course, not as complex behaviors as you know, standing up here and giving this talk, but flies can actually do a lot of things. Um, flies can sleep, they can learn, they can move and climb. Uh, they uh, actually have uh, memory. Um, this is actually a picture of a fly brain uh, under the microscope, so flies have a brain. Uh, they have uh, the same chemical messengers like dopamine and acetylcholine and, and, uh, that are important in uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, things that we can study in a fly brain, even though it is a simple organism compared to humans. How do we study uh, neurodegenerative processes in fruit flies? Um, well, uh, first we can look structurally uh, at the brain or other nervous tissues. Uh, we can look at the fly eye, and there's an example of a fly eye that is dis dis uh, disturbed due to an Alzheimer's-like process. Uh, we can actually look at fly brains and often see tissue destruction, as shown here. Uh, we can look at higher power. We can look and count uh, the cell death within fly brains, and that's I'm showing you an example here. We can put uh, fly brains or nervous tissue under an electron microscope. Here I'm actually showing you the nerve terminals uh, within the fly brain. These are called synapses. Uh, and in an Alzheimer's disease fly model, those synapses uh, seem to be degenerated and dying. Um, more than looking at structure, we can also study function of the nervous system in, in, a, in a model system like the fly. For example, we can stick an electrode into the fly eye, we can shine a pulse of light, and we can record changes that occur uh, in the fly eye as it receives that light pulse and converts it into an electrical uh, brain signal. Uh, and we can see changes in these types of uh, neuronal function that occur in some of the Alzheimer's fly models that we have. Uh, we can look at the lifespan of flies. They're affected in a variety of different models. We can look at how flies climb, uh, which could be important for understanding motor processes subserved by the nervous system, as in a Parkinson's disease fly model. So um, about uh, 20 years ago now, actually, uh, uh, someone who actually taught me a lot about flies, Melfini, said we can take a fly and we can use it to model Alzheimer's disease. And so what she did uh, was to take a, uh, the human gene for this protein tau that I introduced earlier, uh, this gene that is mutated in familial uh, dementia syndromes and that encodes a protein that is one of the characteristic defining features of Alzheimer's disease. You take this human gene, you express it throughout the fly brain, using a Frankenstein-like procedure in which the gene is introduced into the fly genome. And what you begin to see is neurodegeneration when you age the flies. Uh, the flies don't live as long, so they die early. And there are a whole variety of other changes that occur within these fly brains that overlap with the very same things that human neuropathologists use to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Moreover, if you express this protein in the fly eye, you disrupt the fly eye, and so instead of the normal large round eye, you get this narrowed eye with this roughened surface. This turns out to be quite useful for doing uh, genetic screens where you find things that either suppress this effect or enhance this effect, and it helps us to rapidly look at other genes of interest uh, that might be involved in Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So um, this is something that uh, Dr. Ramirez introduced, so I'll go through it uh, quite quickly. But the example of the tau mutation uh, is a rare mutation uh, that causes disease invariably, and that we would call a high penetrant mutation. It is sufficient. If you have it, you will get Alzheimer's disease, okay? But that is very rare. 
most Alzheimer's disease is not caused by single gene mutations like that. So what we now recognize, though, is that uh, genetics probably has a role in almost all Alzheimer's disease and all Parkinson's disease, including those who don't have these single rare mutations. Um, and instead, we think that common genetic variations that individually have very modest effects, uh, which we call low penetrance variants, uh, these sort of act like population risk factors. We're all familiar with population risk factors. For example, smoking and lung cancer. Right? If you smoke, you have an increased risk of developing lung cancer. But not everyone who smokes is going to get lung cancer. Right? It's the same thing with genetic risk factors. You may have the genetic variant. You're at increased risk. It could be a modest risk. It's not a certain thing that you will get the disease, but you are at increased risk. So here's an example of this from Parkinson's disease. Mutations in a gene called glucosuperoxidase, called GBA, this is among the most common and potent risk factors for Parkinson's disease in the general population. This, uh, these mutations cause a five to 10 times increased risk of Parkinson's, okay? Um, but it's important to keep in mind that the risk in the population is quite low, even though Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's disease. So of people who have this gene mutation, the GBA variant, less than 10% of these carriers will actually develop Parkinson's disease by age 65. Right? So having one of these variants does not uh, kind of, th this is not a certainty that you will develop Parkinson's disease. And you can see that in this bit of scientific data, uh, they follow uh, carriers at different ages, and you can see that the line barely gets up above the 10% mark. So the important uh, take home message here is that these risk factors are out there. And because of the types of genetic advances that Dr. Ramirez was describing and because of work by Dr. Sashadri, uh, our field is identifying dozens of these types of risk factors in both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. There's an explosion uh, of, of knowledge surrounding these types of genetic risk factors. And this uh, is a slide that you saw before, uh, which shows you these risk factors spread out throughout the genome. So uh, this is a great thing because it helps us identify regions of the genome that affect risk for Alzheimer's disease. It's also a good thing because these may be clues to the biology of Alzheimer's disease that could be manipulated for new drugs. Unfortunately, and this gets to the first roadblock, the, the, there, is, there are too many of them. We're, we're overwhelmed by the number of these factors, uh, so there is a bottleneck to rapidly study them all. And there's great interest in trying to understand as much as we can as quickly as possible. Which one should we pick? I guess APOE, probably, if you had to pick one. Yeah. But, but you know, we don't know that APOE is going to be easy to manipulate with a drug. So you know, there could be a diamond in the rough here, but we have to get through them quickly. So uh, years ago, we started to do this using flies. We took the fly model of Alzheimer's disease that I introduced early, the model that expresses the human tau protein, and we started manipulating genes at each of these peaks, uh, those genes being conserved in the fly. And we asked, if we manipulate the genes, does it enhance or suppress the neurodegeneration that we see in this fly model of Alzheimer's disease? Can we use the fly to filter through all these genes and identify a set that interfere with this biology that we already understand? And we found, uh, as highlighted with these circles, many that meet those criteria. Um, and here's an example um, where we manipulated a gene called CD2AP, it's circled here, uh, and when we knock that gene down in flies, uh, along with the human tau, we get a smaller and rougher eye. So it appears that knocking down this gene when the tau protein is present uh, enhances the toxicity of tau. It's as if this gene is normally protecting the cell against death due to tau. But when we remove it, the cell is more vulnerable. Okay, great. But there's a second roadblock. Most genes have virtually never been studied in the brain. Okay, so uh, when you have an interesting lead like this, it's not immediately obvious uh, what the next step is, what kind of drug, what does it do, what, what are the side effects of a drug if you were to try to manipulate this gene. So um, this is an example of a gene that you know, I became interested in because of this, these experiments, but there was almost nothing known about what this protein does uh, in the brain. It had been studied a little bit in the kidney, but not in the brain. 
So again, uh, the fly can be useful. Uh, we found that this protein is expressed throughout the fly brain. Uh, we found that we can make mutations in this gene in flies that remove all that protein, as you can see here. And when we study those flies, we found that they have reduced survival, which is shown here. Moreover, uh, we found that this protein is at the terminals of nerves, so synapses. These are the connections within the nervous system. And we actually used electrodes to record uh, from the nerve terminals uh, when this protein is missing in flies. And what we found is that there was a change in the electrical signals that are transmitted uh, by the nerves. Um, so this suggests to us that this protein is actually involved in synaptic biology, in the connections between nerve cells in the brain and, in for, and for neurotransmission. Uh, so I don't have time to tell you the rest of this story because I want to tell you about other roadblocks and other ways that flies have uh, have helped us, but uh, suffice to say that by using the fly to understand CD2AP function, uh, we've been able to then do experiments in mice and actually back in human brain material to show that we think this, these types of functions are conserved. So we're working our way back from the fly now to get to a place where we can actually show that we've learned something that's relevant for human biology, and that's the next step towards hopefully uh, developing uh, new therapies based on these hypotheses. Okay, I want to move to Parkinson's disease. So just like in the case with tau and Alzheimer's disease, uh, families were found, uh, actually, right about just about the same time. There was an explosion right around this time. It's one of the reasons that I chose to become a neurologist, because all these discoveries were being made uh, right when I was deciding whether uh, what I wanted to do with my, with my career after college. Um, so this is a family, it's a famous family. You could see almost everyone in the family is developing Parkinson's disease. And this uh, family, unfortunately, has a rare mutation uh, in a gene called alpha-synuclein. And if you remember from my second or third slide, uh, this is a gene that encodes a protein that aggregates in the brain, that forms the Lewy body. Uh, so this is just eerily parallel to the situation with the tau gene and Alzheimer's disease. Here we have a mutation in a gene that causes a protein that aggregates in the brain and it causes familial Parkinson's disease. And as you might predict, someone decided we should express this protein in the fly. Um, and remarkably, when you express uh, the alpha-synuclein protein in the fly brain, uh, what you see is loss of uh, neurons within the brain. And what I'm showing you in green here are neurons that use the chemical transmitter dopamine. And you can see here that compared to normal flies, uh, when you look at these alpha-synuclein flies, the number of dopamine neurons is reduced. And it actually seems to depend on the amount of synuclein that's expressed, low, high. So dose-dependent loss of dopaminergic neurons. Now these are the neurons that actually are lost in human Parkinson's disease. That was that black stripe that was depigmented uh, that I showed you on my early slides. So you can see that the Parkinson's flies uh, are slower to climb up the vial. And flies have this natural tendency to want to climb uh, when, when they are knocked down to the bottom. They like, they like to to move against gravity, and I'll show you that again. Um, this can be quantified precisely, and you can see that the human Parkinson's disease model flies uh, don't climb as well, and this gets worse as you age the flies. It's age-dependent, and we can also use this uh, retinal assay that I introduced earlier to find changes in these animals. We also can look at the uh, brains of these flies, and we can find that the tissue just really falls apart as we increase the level of human alpha-synuclein protein uh, or as we age the animals. Um, so these flies have a number of features that are very similar to things that we attribute to Parkinson's disease pathogenesis, loss of dopaminergic neurons, uh, age-dependent uh, neuronal loss, uh, and, and even locomotor impairment. So um, what have we done with these flies? Well, uh, I want to show you this. This is a, a, a genetic study in which we sequenced the genomes as part of a consortium 
uh, of more than 1,000 Parkinson's disease cases and 500 control individuals. Um, and one of the take home messages from this slide, there's a lot of information on the slide, I apologize, but uh, that first of all, when you do sequencing of the genome, you discover lots and lots of changes, okay? So there were like almost a million different variants that we found, okay? So there are lots of changes, and that, so that, that's a challenge to figure out, well, which ones are the ones that are causing Parkinson's disease? And so we can use uh, all sorts of filters to try to narrow it down. And even after doing that, we found 27 genes uh, that had mutations that were like kind of completely lost of, you know, there no function. They were knocked out of individuals within our cohort. 27 genes completely lost of function in our in cohort of 1,000. The problem is, is that we only found each of these once in one individual. So it's like a single observation, okay? So this uh, brings us to a roadblock. The, the rarity of mutations uh, when you do a study like this makes it really difficult to find something that happens more than once. And if you can't find something that happens more than once, it's hard to convince anybody that it's doing something uh, because you've just seen it once. Um, so, so this is another roadblock. So what we did in this case uh, is we took these 27 uh, candidate genes and we manipulated them uh, in the fly Parkinson's disease model. And so each human gene, there are 13 of the 27 that are conserved in flies, and I'm showing you four cases in which we knock down the fly gene, and what we see is a significant enhancement uh, in the neurodegenerative changes that we see in the fly Parkinson's disease model. And when we manipulate the gene on its own, there's no change. So uh, this f told us that four out of the 27 uh, actually seem to uh, enhance alpha-synuclein-mediated alpha uh, neurodegeneration, which we think is a really fundamental process in Parkinson's disease uh, pathogenesis. And one of these genes, called VPS13, uh, was subsequently replicated, where we actually found other individuals, other families, uh, where, uh, where, where this gene seems to be causative for Parkinson's disease. So uh, this is a type of approach that can try to overcome one of these roadblocks. That was kind of the message here. So I wanna end uh, by shifting gears one last time and talking about um, the transcriptome, okay? You may have never heard that term before. Uh, the transcriptome is like the executioner of the genome, okay? So the, the, it, here's the genome, right? You, the, the gene recipe, the recipe, uh, the DNA recipe is there. You have to make proteins. And in order to make proteins, uh, you need to make transcripts. And the transcriptome is all of the expressed proteins, more or less, okay? Oversimplifying a little bit. Um, but there, when you, you can now, with new methods, you can profile the entire transcriptome in the brain, including from human brains. Uh, this has been done in thousands of human brains. Uh, and this gives you a snapshot uh, of the state of the brain, all the genes that are expressed within the genome. And uh, so there's great promise from this type of information because uh, if we can figure out those changes in the transcriptome that occur in Alzheimer's disease, such as due to plaques and tangles, you know, maybe we can find new uh, mechanisms or new drug targets. Um, and so the goal is to kind of take the transcriptome change, figure out what's specific to Alzheimer's, and then organize it into pathways that then suggest where we should direct our drugs at. Um, as you can imagine, there are roadblocks. Uh, there are many roadblocks. I'm highlighting two here. Uh, one is uh, when you see changes like this, it's very hard to figure out what the specific triggers are. I mean, I'm showing you two triggers here, right? Tau tangles, amyloid plaques. But brains have other things in them besides these changes. There could be alpha-synuclein for Parkinson's disease. There could be vascular damage from strokes. Uh, there could be life experiences. You could have been punched in the head. There are a variety of things that could affect the transcriptome. And in order to kind of get at novel drug targets and mechanisms, you need to understand specific triggers for the changes that you observe. An even bigger problem is that we don't want just any change. We want the changes that cause disease, right? So as cells are dying, there may be all kinds of changes that are very late, that, ha that happen once the disease has started or where, where the destiny of the cell death is already uh, frozen. 
Uh, we want to identify those changes that are hopefully early and that are causal. So uh, we're, we're, we're therefore uh, embarked on a project to manipulate thousands of genes in flies to try to figure out those causal changes. Uh, but I just want to give you this example to kind of highlight this uh, point. Um, so, so here is a group of 400 genes that form a network within the transcriptome. You can see that they increase modestly in human brains. This is based on about 1,000 brains with transcriptome profiles. You can see that they increase from normal cognition to mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease going up ever so slightly. Um, so the question is, is this an example of a network that is causal, and what is the specific trigger? Uh, so one thing we've done is to take the Alzheimer's disease fly model that I told you about and also make transcriptome profiles on those flies, and to do that with flies that are 1 days, 10 days, or 20 days old. So this allows us to figure out those changes that, cha that go with age and those changes that go with the tau, Alzheimer's disease process. And what we find is that we can find overlaps for most of the networks and transcriptome changes that we find in human brains within the fly brain. And we can start decoding those that are due to tau or age, okay? So we can understand the relationship of tau to network changes. And then we can manipulate genes within those networks and say, what happens to toxicity and neurodegeneration? And in this particular example, I'm showing you one such change where we manipulate the gene and it enhances tau toxicity. So this allows us to answer that second question about causality and disease. So triggers and causality. So this is just the end, and I want to summarize um, with these take-home messages. Uh, genetics likely influences most cases of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Uh, gene discovery is only the beginning. Uh, there really are many challenges that have to be overcome after you discover a gene to kind of really understand the mechanisms. And hopefully I've convinced you that fruit fly models are one approach uh, to accelerate the translation of genetic insights to new therapies. And I showed a lot of different experiments that I've done with a lot of different people, including some that I just took from them. So uh, I want to thank all of the people who provided data. And, you guys can visit us. This is my institute in uh, Houston, not too far away. You could also visit Colm. I'd prefer to visit Colm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.